ask that you would, in these next moments, open up our ears and our eyes to your word. For it is our will to obey you, to do what you said. And that we might live lives to your glory. It would greatly benefit us too. So thank you, Lord, what you're going to do. Seal your word to our hearts even before we start. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, you in the back, can you hear me okay? No. 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 Tom, can you, do you have anything more? I'm on. Okay. Tom, is that all you got there? Okay. We are having some mic problems, and we ordered some mics this week, so we're doing the best we can. I think you all know that it's common knowledge that a business is only as good as its employees. in any organization is crucial to the health of that organization. As a manager at the container store in Dallas, Texas, this was one of the assignments for Pat, was the hiring process. And they had a hiring process where they would have online submissions. Tom, um, that's, that's on, so I guess that's the best we got. You can try, you can try turning this on. Maybe that'll help. And so hiring was one of her responsibilities. And now what they would typically do is they would have online submissions. And after the online submission, they would take a group of people and they would invite them in. And they would invite them in for a group session or a group interview. Well, what these... Uh, Want, these who wanted the job, what they did not realize was as soon as they walked through the door, they were being observed. All of them. Are we getting some interference here? Okay. We have all kinds of things going on this morning, don't we? <laughs> it's amazing how if I put two thoughts together here. Maybe I should just open up with my closing prayer. <laughs> so these hopeful job seekers would come into this interview and they did not realize that they were being observed as soon as they walked through the doors. Observed in what way? They were being observed as to how they interacted with other people, people they knew, people they didn't know. And so Patty would strategically locate herself off to the side. And they didn't know that she was a manager, that she just looked like a normal employee of the store. But she would observe. And being discerning and having a gift of discernment, she would watch people's actions. Well, there were a couple men that caught her attention for the right reason. And as she observed them, there were two young guys, rather handsome, well-dressed, and very professional looking, probably just a few years out of college. And she was watching them talk to each other. They were kind of ignoring the other people there. And Patty observed as a uh, grandmother type came up and introduced herself to these two young, what Patty was learning, rather cocky young men. And as this grandmother approached them, um, she smiled. Um, they just kind of looked down at her without any emotion. And she offered her hand, and one took it, and the other one was just kept his hands in his pockets. As this grandmother kind of walked away, uh, Patty noticed that the two men were mocking her. And Patty's like, OK. I've noted that, and it is observed. But let me ask you a question. If you're in Patty's shoes, what would you have been thinking about those two young guys? How they treated her. Now, would that be, would you say, hey, look, that's just life. That's, that's how things go. That's how people treat one another. Or would you say, you know, that, that's not right, and then do nothing about it? Or would it irritate you? 
See, the subject that we're looking at this morning is that attitude existed in the church, and James is addressing it. The name of the, what I've called in the sermon is putting prejudice to death in the church because it doesn't belong here. If you would, take your hand out, out now and you'll want to write some notes from God's word. I don't pretend to say anything profound, but God does. And so what I want you to realize as we go through this this morning, we're going to be in James chapter 2 in verses 1 through 13. So if you would, as you take your hand out, out, Open up your Bibles. I expect that you do bring your Bible here uh, because, as Harold has already told us, he saw transformation in people's lives, not when he talked to them, but when they allowed God to talk to them through his word. And that is where the transformation happens because God's word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And so what I want you to realize this morning as we look at this prejudice or favoritism is that there's three steps that James gives us to overcome that here. The first step is going to be courtesy to all. You extend courtesy to all. And you can see that on your handout. The second point will be we have compassion for all. And the third step is consistency in all things. And so what I want you to realize, in this section, we will find both condemnation and correction. And so let me read a few of the verses, and then we'll dig into them a bit. James writes in chapter 2, verse 1, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, so I want you to think one man comes in like a maybe uh, an expensive suit and tie and rings and jewelry hanging from his neck, and the next guy, he's in rumpled clothes. Do you treat them differently? Do you give one more? And James says, you are. Look at what he says. If you pay, verse 3, if you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor guy, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Now comes the question. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, which is you shall love your neighbors yourself, well, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, well, you have become a transgressor of the law. What do we do? Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so James in his direct style has hit them right between the eyes with favoritism in the church. What I want to do is I want to read to you the first verse here again, but I'm going to do it from the New Living Translation. I think they did a very good job of translating this. The New Living Translation in verse 1 says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? This shouldn't be. Why? Because it happens everywhere, right? Now, what I want you to realize up front, there's going to be a natural affinity, but we should treat everybody equally here. Even as a pastor, one of the things that I've protected myself from is I have no idea what anybody, not even one person, gives in this church. Why would I do that? 
because I don't want that to affect me. And that would start to affect me in knowing, well, this person's mad. and Boy, they give a lot of money. I better take good care of them. That can't be. It can't be. So it doesn't matter what you give. I'm your shepherd. I'm here to care for you, regardless of what you do or you don't do. And so that gives me freedom. And that's the freedom I want, the freedom to love you all. We need that freedom that we don't make those judgment calls on one another. What, you see so-and-so? Did you see the house he lives in or she lives in or the money or the bank account they have? It happens, and it was happening there. So let me give you real quick fire eight reasons up front why favoritism is wrong. It is inconsistent with what Jesus lived, taught, and commanded. Number two, it results from evil thoughts. This is all out of the text. You can go back and look and find these in the text. Number three, it insults people made in God's image. And so you have a poor person made in God's image, and we disdain them, look down our lofty nose at them because, well, they're just not like me. It is a byproduct of selfish motives. Oftentimes, we want to identify ourselves with people who are apparently successful. And we do not want to so socialize with people who might look like apparent failures because, well, quite frankly, they don't have much. It goes against the biblical definition of love. That's number five. Number six, it shows a lack of mercy to those who are less fortunate. One of the things I've learned as a pastor is we have no idea the pain that lies behind the eyes of many people. And they're not going to share it with you. It's too personal. But sometimes it comes out in our behavior. And we need to give each other grace and not judge one another. Number seven, it's hypocritical. Do you know what your birthmark is as a Christian? Jesus told us the last night before he went to the cross, a new command I give you, love one another. And he changed it up and he said, not as you love yourself, but as I've loved you. This is how people will know you belong to me. If you love one another. You see, that's our birthmark. That's our family resemblance, is how we love. Now, that's going to be different. So I don't want you to think that we should treat everybody equal. There's another principle uh, hidden here, and that is fair is not always equal. Fair is not always equal. What does that mean? That means that there's going to be people here where we have a natural affinity to. We just have a connection. And that connection might be history, it might be education, it might be hobbies, it might be something completely different. And we're going to spend more time with them and they're going to become our closest friends. That's great. That is going to happen. And it should. But what I'm talking about is fair is not always equal, is that doesn't give us the right to look down our lofty nose at somebody we think is underneath us. And so it's hypocritical. Number eight, it's sin. Like I said, all of these are in the text and when we read through it. And so this was evident in this first century church, churches that James was writing to. And today it's still the same thing. We still judge by outward appearances. And God is saying this should not be. We are to be a different group of people. God is freeing us up from those judgments. One of the things that we need to remember is, and as a pastor, it's been freeing for me, it's not my job to judge anybody. And it's not your job to judge anybody. Jesus is the judge. Paul said, I don't even judge myself. The Lord's going to judge me. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't make judgment calls, and we all get a little confused with this. Like I've said before, if somebody bangs on my door and they have a gun in the hand and a mask on, I'm going to make a judgment call and not open that door. We do make judgment calls. And so what he is talking about is we tend to make judgments even today on wealth. And wealth can be something that has just come to somebody. They may have been born into a wealthy family. It also could be a sign that somebody has made good decisions 
they're hardworking, and they're very intelligent. Some other people think that if you have a lot of blessing, it's a sign of God's blessing. And yet Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to suffer for me. So the first step I want you to see here, without complicating this too much, is that if we're going to overcome that favoritism here, we extend the same courtesy to everyone, regardless of where they're from, regardless of their financial status, regardless of what they wear to church, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their age, regardless if they have tattoos up both arms. The same courtesy to all, because all are made in the image of God. All men and women are. Extend courtesy is just the first step, but in verses 5 through 9, we're to have compassion on all. The problem is we make subjective, shallow, and sinful judgments about people based on what we see. And we have stopped making judgment calls on people's character. Some of the folks that I have seen that are just dirt poor have the most character. But not always. There are some people that have quite a bit and they have a lot of character but you'll never know it until you get to know them. What I want you to realize and what James brings out in verses five through nine, he says, listen, my beloved brethren, did God not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Many times God has picked the poor. And many times it's the poor who recognize their need for God. And one of the things I realized with Patty is that she did not, while she did not grow up poor, she grew up in a family that they didn't go to church. And so while her parents were not Christians, they would set her on a bus and she'd go to church. Well, if there's going to be a big event where a summer event or a youth camp or something like that, there was no support at home for her. She had to depend on God. And if God didn't make it happen, it wasn't going to happen. And because she didn't have that support at home, she found God is real and she found that he was true and she found out that God does come through and I think it's the same for all of us but I have found many times I had one man even tell me he was had a good business and he was he was well off and I remember him telling me you know what I just don't bother God with the small stuff and I kind of got that what he didn't realize it sounded pious to him but it was actually pride because God wants to meet us in all our needs. And the truth is, all of our needs are small in comparison to what God can do. And so he wants us to depend on him and not get proud. James goes on to say, verse 6, But you have dishonored the poor man, the very one that God has selected. He's made in God's image. And then he goes on to say, it's the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court. Many times it's the rich that looks down on the poor and said, yeah, you need God because you need a crutch, but I got me. And I'm good. I got it covered. And that's a truth that I still see today. Not everywhere, but it does happen. Verse 7, do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? Many times the rich cut God down saying, I don't need him. Verse 8, if however you're fulfilling the royal law, the royal law of love one another as I've loved you, according to scripture, and he goes on to say, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself, you're doing well. But here's his point. If you show partiality, if you show favoritism, you're committing a sin. You're missing the mark. You're not doing what God wants you to do. James doesn't mix his words up. He tells it straight. And you're convicted by the law as transgressors. I want you to consider for a second, and I have a note there for you to look at at home. But on your outline, you will see that I've marked 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. I want to read it to you in a version that you're not used to. The version I'm going to read is uh, The Message uh, by Eugene Peterson. Not a version that you're going to study out of but he has a way of putting some things right into our modern day language that hits. Here's who God picks, according to Paul 
in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. He says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you, call, when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential. Not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks, exploits, and abuses? He chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start, comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. That's why we are saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. And so who does God pick? Many times it's the lowly. It's those that the world disdains. It's the poor. It's those that are not the top shelf. It's not the elite. First time I read this, I thought, man, I qualify. I qualify for this. That's where I'm from. And so James is telling us that the method for us to overcome any, any prejudice in the church, for us to put it to death in the church, that we need to have courtesy to all. That's step one. We predecide that everybody we meet, we're going to treat them with courtesy, kindness greet them with a smile and a handshake if appropriate the second step is to have compassion for all because you don't know where they've come from and what they're struggling from or why they're even here the third step and final step is consistency in all things look at what he says in verses 10 through 13 for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point he has become guilty of all Sounds funny to us, but he's writing to a Jewish audience. And the Jewish audience understood that when you looked at the law or the Ten Commandments and even the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, as they knew it, they looked at it as individual, they didn't look at it as individual pains. Well, okay, well, I broke that one, so, well, that one's broken, but I got these nine left, so I'm good. That's not the way they looked at it. They looked at the law as just one pane of glass. You broke one, you shattered the whole thing. And so James is saying, if you break down in one area, you lost the whole deal. And so he says in verse 10, forever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, and he illustrates it here, do not commit murder. But if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, well, guess what? You become a transgressor. You're a sinner. And so he's saying to them, and this is the message I want you to get. It's just a little sin. No big deal. God doesn't grade sin. Okay? So whether it's a little one or a big one in our book, God says, you missed the mark. That's a sin. It's wrong. Now, sins here in our culture have different consequences so if you trip up a member here by disdaining them or looking down your nose at them the consequences might be a broken friendship if you go out and run into somebody in your car well there's going to be greater consequences right and you did that on purpose to hurt them but see God looks at it on his end theologically a sin is a sin is a sin that's what James is saying why is he saying it because James seems to know that no doubt some of the people that he is writing this letter to would say, that's no big deal. Doesn't James understand? That's just me. That's the way I treat people like that. I don't like people like that. I don't like foreigners. I don't like older people. I don't like younger people. I don't like people fill in the blank. And James is saying, no, not at all. You're not going to dismiss my statement because God sees it all as missing the mark. Your job is give courtesy to all, have compassion for all. And so he finishes out here by saying, speak and act. 
what we don't see here in our language, but you can see it very clearly in the Greek, is he wrote this as a command that you are to continue to do. And so it's a present active imperative is the way we look at it. Well, what does that mean? What it means is, literally, he is saying, you must keep speaking and you must keep acting as those who will be judged by the royal law. What does he mean by that? What he means by that is we are going to be judged. Did you know that even as a believer you're going to go through judgment? Did you know that? You all know that, don't you? Did I lose you someplace? Is this thing on? You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, what we call the Bema seat. Not to see if you get into heaven, for if you have truly trusted alone in Christ alone as the only way to heaven, that's a done deal. Which I want to ask you, have you done that? Have you come to a point in your life where you realize God sees me as someone who is a sinner, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all of us. And so what did God do? He sent his son. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for you and for me. And what must we do? God answers that question. For it is by grace, something you're getting that you don't deserve, and me too. For it is by grace you're saved by faith. It's trusting alone in Christ alone. Have you done that? If you haven't, now would be a good day to do that, to go to him in prayer and say, God, I understand. I've done wrong. I'm dysfunctional. I've messed up. Call it what you want. But God calls it sin, missing the mark. I understand today that Jesus died for me. And I'm trusting in him as the only way to heaven. God saved me, and he will. You can do that here. You can do that at home. But you need to do it. If you have, you only need to do it once. And you become a child of God. And so now you're judged differently. You won't be at what we call the great white throne judgment. Everybody who stands at that judgment will end up in the lake of fire or hell. But for us, we will be judged on what we did and our obedience and how we did, how faithful we were to what God called you to do and me to do. So how do we apply this? Well, let me finish my story. And I'll tell you how we apply it. Back to that story, back to that group interview, back to Patty standing over there and watching those two young cocky men look down their proud noses at Grandma. Patty sat there and she continued to watch them and watch the other people in the room. And then as the meeting was to get started, the general manager of the store was introduced. And guess who the general manager of the store was? Grandma. <laughs> Patty looked again over at those guys. And they were rolling their eyes like, we ain't getting a job here. And they were right. They did not get a job there. So when we look down our lofty nose at someone, we think nobody's watching, but I'll guarantee you this, God is watching, and he wants to love your world through you. Amen. This world right in this room, this world in your house, this world in your area of influence, be a light, be an encouragement, be for that fresh air of encouragement when you walk into a room. It doesn't mean you have to act, but it does mean you need to care. Let's be world changers of our little world. Look for something positive to say to others. Let's be like a Charles Stanley that even with his grandson called him up and his grandson was tanking his life in his, in his mid to late 20s and said, why don't you give Jesus another chance? That, in, that in, in, impacted him. Let's be that kind of person. If you would, let's remember that God calls us to be courteous to one another at all times. We can do this.
Let's have compassion for one another. Let's ask people questions. Let's ask one another questions. How was your week? And then do something radical. Listen to what they say. And let's be consistent in all that we do. That's what God calls us to. Faithfulness. What has he asked you to do? Be faithful. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, I pray that you would help me and help us all to be people who constantly look out for others. Let us be those people who extend courtesy to everyone we meet, wherever it is, whether it be a wait staff in a restaurant or be a servant or be someone who's uh, serving us. Let us, let us be courteous to all especially to one another. Let us have compassion for one another and let us be consistent in how we treat others. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.